All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Ridgey, and welcome to our New York City Mayoral Candidate Forum, New York City Restaurant and Nightlife Edition. So, you know, I always say it, our city's restaurant and nightlife industry is vital to the economic, social, and cultural fabric of our city. And our industry has been absolutely devastated. Uh, over the past year, we've lost more than 140. 40,000 jobs in our city's eating and drinking establishment. Thousands of small businesses have shuttered. Countless more are really teetering on the edge of survival. And in order for the city of New York to recover, we need our city's restaurants and nightlife spots to be at the core of that recovery. And that's why the next mayoral candidate forum, but really the next uh, mayor is going to be so critical in helping rebuild and support our industry throughout what I imagine will be quite a long recovery. Uh, this will also be an interesting year as it's the first year in our city's history where we are going to have ranked choice voting that will determine the next mayor. Uh, the primary election will be held on June 22nd. Voters are going to rank their top five candidates in order and if one candidate does not get 50%, whoever gets the fewest first place votes is eliminated. And then those ballots uh, who chose the loser will go to their second choice and so on. And that process continues until someone wins the majority of votes. Uh, and I want you all to know, these are some incredible candidates. We're also gonna be hosting some additional forums with, with other candidates. I know many of you have spoken uh, with us about, so this is part one, and I couldn't think of a better way to start out um, part one. But if you're marking your calendars, March 3rd, uh, which is a Wednesday from four to 6 p.m. will be the next forum. I also wanna let you know that we received so many great questions uh, from members. It was really difficult to choose which ones to ask. Uh, but we think we have chosen some that are so fundamentally important to the next mayor. We also want to make the most out of the time and ensure that the questions that we ask are related to the authority and really within the scope of what a mayor of New York City uh, can do when they take office in 2022. So before we get into the conversation, I want to just thank our sponsor tonight, KI Legal Services. Uh, they're a Manhattan-based law firm representing restaurants and hospitality groups, and they're advocates for the industry, fighting alongside their clients, working with the Hospitality Alliance, and their work encompasses legal representation to establishments and to operators. They're really hands-on, and they have know-how because they come from the industry. Uh, the co-founding partners, Andreas Kousadakis and Michael Ikevo, uh, are the team of legal professionals. And you can learn more about kilegal.com. Um, but even on a more serious note, um, one of the partners, Andreas Kousadakis, who is a dear friend of mine and so many, you may know or recall his father, uh, Andy Kousadakis from Tribeca, um, sorry, Tribeca's Kitchen. Um, uh, early on in the pandemic, we lost Andy to COVID. Uh, Andy was really just what defined hospitality, the warmth, the working around the clock. Uh, even before he opened up Tribeca's Kitchen, you may remember down by City Hall too, gee whiz, after 9-11, after Hurricane Sandy, he was just there. I remember not this past the Christmas before Andreas and his daughter and my daughter, we were having Christmas breakfast uh, brunch there and his dad's giving out presents. And we fight so hard for the future of our city's industry for people like Andy, who's, uh, you know, have contributed so much. So just want to say thank you and, uh, you know, recognize him and many others that we lost over this very trying year. So Overview of the forum. First part one, we are going to focus on the mayoral introductions. Part two, we have six questions and each candidate will have two minutes to answer each question. And then part three is going to be the six rapid fire questions. And I know some of the candidates have another forum right after this, so we're gonna to try to get through it quickly. Again, thanks for your support of the Hospitality Alliance for our first mayoral forum for the restaurant and nightlife industry. You can learn more about the Hospitality Alliance at thenycalliance.com, or sorry, .org. You can email us at info at thenycalliance.org. You can find us on social media, which you all know. And I want to welcome, finally, 
the candidates running for mayor of the city of New York in alphabetical order, to be fair. We're gonna start first, I say by last name, <laughs> um, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, Ray McGuire, Maya Wiley, and New York City Comptroller Scott Stringer. Uh, Andrew Yang was supposed to uh, join us this evening, but unfortunately he's actually at home recovering from COVID. So we wish him a very speedy recovery and he is scheduled to speak at one of our future forums in a few weeks. So with that in order, it's gonna go uh, Eric, Ray, Maya, Scott, uh, starting with Eric, you have two minutes uh, for an introduction, um, you know, and I'll hop in at about 30 seconds left uh, just to give you an FYI. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you. And I always bring my stopwatch. So, you know, I'll stay within the time limits. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. And there's a saying that I say all the time. I'm, I am not new to this. I am true to this. And nothing personifies that more uh, than this conversation. I've been on the forefront of the issues of how do we protect our bars, our restaurants, our nightlife. It is part of the tourism uh, that really attracts people to this city. This was a city that never slept. And for some reason, uh, individuals believe that the destruction of the nightlife was not going to impact our entire city. Uh, gear one at Brooklyn Ball Hall, I formed the Brooklyn Nightlife and Restaurant Coalition with Dave Rosen from Brooklyn Alive Bars and Restaurants, uh, acronym BBAR. Uh, we knew back then the importance of bringing our nightlife industries uh, together. And this was a few years ahead of the formation of the Office of Nightlife. And I knew that we can actually create the coalition we were looking for, a partnership between government and the city. There's so much we must do. We must stop the heavy handed enforcement. We must reform what we are doing with the state liquor authority. The lack of uh, surety is uncertain. Each time they walk into your establishment, uh, we are more focused on I gotcha instead of I got your back to make sure that we can keep you open during these difficult times. And I know this industry so well, not because I own the bar restaurant, because I was a dishwasher as a young man. I know how difficult it is and how fine the margins are and how much you have to ensure the coordination of your staff and all others. I'm here for you and I'm not a new friend, I'm an old friend. Thank you, Bar President. Uh, Ray McGuire. Thank you, it's so important. This is one of, if not the most essential parts of New York City. I'm running for mayor because New York City is in a crisis and it lead, needs leadership that meets this moment. While I know the burdens of poverty and discrimination, I also know the transformative power of education opportunity for my own life. I understand the world of business and budget for my own career. And I have a vision for bringing jobs and justice to every neighborhood so the city can recover and heal. And at the essence of this is our nightlife, 66 million visitors, 25 to $30 billion worth of tax revenue. To get this done, we need to make certain that we do the following. We need to focus on quality of life. That means safe and clean streets, reliable and safe public transportation to get to and experience our restaurants and our nightlife. We need to support the artists. We're so much a part of this. I'd like to see a 24 month stipend to keep the artists in the city. I'd also like to convert underused space into portable artist studios. And restaurants needed badly and they need bad help. 200,000 restaurants. And the problem is, is that fines that get extracted. I got 47, 45 fines from seven different agencies. And how do I intend to address this? One is I want to stage the Comeback Festival, which is a year long festival kicking off in the spring of 22, include every venue, every restaurant, gallery, performance stages, bars, and restaurants. And I'm going to do that through what I call my economic comeback plan, McGuire Comeback Plan go big, go small, go forward which at its core includes restaurants and making certain those restaurants get a lifeline through either uh, supporting 50% of their wages or making certain that they get relief with sales taxes for a year, making certain that we negotiate their utilities and their rent, making certain that they have the finances either through grants or through equity to continue their survival and thriving. Restaurants are essential to New York City 
They're essential to my experience in New York City, and they're essential to all New Yorkers and New Yorkers' well-being. Thank you, Ray. Maya, the virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you. I, I will acknowledge that W usually comes after S. So, uh, but but sorry, Scott. <laughs> so listen, it's a it's a pleasure to be here because of how centrally important nightlife restaurants are to what we all love about New York City. I am the daughter of civil rights activists, organizers spent 30 years of my life as a racial justice attorney and advocate. Uh, but my mother was a small business owner. She, after my father died, not only hung out a shingle and got government contracts to do things like institute affirmative action programs, living out her values while she supported the family. Uh, but when the bottom fell out of that business, she opened an art gallery because that was another love of hers. And I watched her struggle. I used to help her with her openings, you know, serving wine, <laughs> uh, but it was a labor of love and a joy. And many of the folks that she was in relationship with were the other small business owners on her block. And I know as a New Yorker, both how critically important this $35 billion worth of economy is to our city, but more importantly, the fact that 95% of our businesses are small and that the restaurant hospitality industry, that's 300,000 jobs right there. And when COVID struck, you know, one of the things that my neighbors and I did, because we so desperately wanted to hold on to our small businesses, including our restaurants, is we organized a volunteer network to try to help folks both know what programs were available to help them and know how to, uh, how they could access them. And we saw firsthand just how few really benefited from the federal programs. And one of the big reasons, and it's one that's also critically important to restaurants, is huge problem was the rent. And guess what? Just like we saw and on every other issue like evictions and affordable housing, the problems that COVID have laid bare were also problems before COVID struck. And one of the things that I am going to put out a plan on shortly is on affordable commercial rent and meeting with restaurants as its own industry because I've heard from business owners and know from my mother's own that there are different business models and that one size does not fit all. And that we, if we are gonna come back as a city, but also recover the core of our communities, it is because we are gonna recover our nightlife, which is one of the things we love about it. And I look forward to listening and learning and leading in partnership with the folks who are directly impacted, who have to be heard and be part of the solution. And city government is going to be that partner when I am mayor. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, the controller's back. I saw he put his arm, maybe he was grabbing something. So I figured I'd jump to you. But uh, now the virtual floor is yours, Mr. Controller. Thank you very much, Andrew. And it really is great to be here. I do want to first uh, pay quick tribute uh, to Andy, uh, G. Wiz, uh, G. Wiz, and Tribeca. These were and continue to be uh, amazing places where community comes together. And in uh, Tribeca Diner is where I have plotted my mayoral race for many years. It's where Eric Adams took me to breakfast for my birthday right before the pandemic. There's a lot of history and I just want Andy's wonderful son to know he was always proud of his son, the lawyer. And because we recognize our small businesses, we have to also recognize the reality that I understand working with all of you for a very long time as an assemblyman, as borough president, as controller. You know, we've lost 101,000 jobs in the restaurant industry, in the bar industry. Uh, these are jobs that, I mean, have provided a base for families to get their kids to college. Uh, you can't bring back New York City and 62 million tourists unless you have an opportunity to bring back our restaurant industry. And it's not gonna be easy. And it's going to take financial skill that I have as controller, but it also has to do with understanding how we bring community and the res restaurant industry together in the struggle. And quite frankly, this is the work I've done with all of you on this Zoom, going back more times than I'm willing to commit. And fight right now, the fight's gonna be tough because we know even before the pandemic, the restaurant industry has been struggling. And as part of my plan, 
to bring the industry back. We have to also reimagine our streetscape open space today. I put forth the most comprehensive plan to reimagine the streets of the city. Mayors control the streets and mayors have to work with the industry to make sure that we can move outdoor dining permanent open spaces because that will do a couple of things. It'll bring our tourism back to life. It will bring our restaurants back to life. It will bring our hotels and all the surrounding economies uh, back to a place where we can imagine. How do we do this? Well, we're gonna have to look at science and medicine and strategy. We're also gonna have to make sure that we get the government agencies off the backs of small businesses. They are finding and feeing these agencies. We have in the Department of Buildings, a person called the expediter that you have to hire to, to interact with the Department of Buildings. That ends when I'm mayor. We also need to make sure that we streamline the bureaucracy, introduce technology with permits uh, and uh, a whole host of different reforms that can just make this industry uh, viable and also turn a profit. So I'm excited about this conversation. Many of us have longstanding relationships. We've been in the battle together, going back to the Upper West Side when I was in the assembly as Manhattan Borough President, and now as city controller working with you on understanding the economy of the city. And let me just say, when I win this primary, I'm gonna be ready on day one. No learning curve, no training wheels. I'm gonna be ready to work with you to bring this economy back. Thank you. All right, well, wonderful introductions. Now we are going to get to the question segment. Uh, in this segment, we have a total of six questions. Each candidate will be asked one question by a different restaurateur or nightlife operator from each borough, plus from our very own Rob Bookman. Uh, each candidate, again, will have a maximum of two minutes to answer each question. Uh, and the order in which candidates will answer will not be in alphabetical order, but it will rotate. Uh, so first, uh, this order is going to go Ray McGuire, Scott Stringer, Maya Wiley, Eric Adams. And to ask this question, I'll bring up, who I see she's just appearing on the screen, uh, Melba Wilson of Melba's Restaurant in Harlem. Melba, as she always says, was born, bred, and buttered in the village of Harlem. She is a dear friend that I love so, so much. She's also the president of the New York City Hospitality Alliance, the one and only Melba Wilson. Please ask your question. Good early evening to everyone there. It's an honor and a pleasure to see all of you here with us today. As a small business owner who's as Andrew said, born, bred and buttered here in the village of Harlem and who's literally started out as a cashier. Um, I am living the American dream. However, it's also been a very, very tough dream. And it was a tough dream before COVID. You know, I love this industry and I love our city. However, the city makes it very, very difficult for a small business owner such as myself. Um, um, to operate. I'm actually now sitting not at Melba's, but at a restaurant that was slated to open, another restaurant of mine that was slated to open March uh, 20th. And as you can see, the chairs behind me are here waiting for the doors to open. One of the problems that we have is you often hear about high commercial rents, how they burden small businesses. But in many commercial leases, the property taxes, which have skyrocketed over the years, get passed through to the tenants, like me, the restaurant owners. My question is, as mayor, what will you do to address these property tax burdens placed on uh, the restaurant industry? So I think that, uh, hello, uh, Melba, I think this happens to land with me first, Andrew. And let me let me say this. We are now in a world where uh, the high property taxes in many neighborhoods have driven up the rents for small businesses, which has caused significant turnover and a lot of vacant storefronts. And this happened, as you know, well before the pandemic. The property system uh, is outdated and doesn't account for much of the gentrification that we've seen in so many neighborhoods around the city. So it has made certain that those small businesses who could once afford those neighborhoods, remember they can no longer be there. The result of what you see such high turnover. And what I will commit to is fiction, what is a broken tax system 
that places the unfair burden on, on many of the middle class homeowners and small businesses and lower income. And what we know is that with the revenue slash, thousands of small business owners simply cannot, they can't pay the rent. And many small landlords also are in danger of defaulting on their mortgage payments. So what I've outlined in my, in my plan, go big, go small, go forward, is to create a menu of financial relief options that can be made available to the property owners in exchange for lowering or forgiving rent or providing early lease breaks or sublease and other tenant, other tenant benefits. The other thing that I was gonna do is I've had several conversations on this, and that is to, you know, I've talked to the to the business owners. They say, listen, we pay kind at 100 cents on the dollar, and we make 10 cents on the dollar. And so we can no longer afford that. So I would say I'm going to work with Con Ed to provide deferred payments. And finally, what I intend to do is launch what I call the Comeback Bank Initiative, which is going to provide uh, grants, small businesses, two small businesses, deferred payments through a community development financial institution and other community banks so that we can relieve the pressure. It's going to be grants and equity. At one point, I thought maybe low interest loans, but what we recognize today and talking to many of these small business owners is they got too much debt already. So we have to eliminate that as one of the solutions. It's gonna be grant and equity. And I've done this before. And part of this is a public private partnership where we fund okay. some of the community banks to make sure that they can invest in these small businesses and relieve a lot of the burden that, that is so heavy. Thank you. Thank you, Controller Stringer. Well, first of all, uh, hi, Melba, and one of the best places to go when this industry is back bigger than ever, go to Melba's. There's a drink called the BP. It's short for borough president, named after me, mm -hmm. and I only have one or two because they're strong. But uh, I want to get right to the question as well. Look, I propose the business income tax credit to help with reopening costs and back payments and a property tax credit for opening in businesses in high vacancy rates. So it's two strategies. One, we have got to give tax relief to the businesses who are barely hanging on. They're actually paying more to move in outdoor venues, but we also have to incentivize new businesses or existing businesses to eventually expand in our vacant uh, um, commercial quarters. I did a report pre-pandemic that showed that we had doubled the amount of Re empty retail space from 5 million square feet to 10 million square feet. That was between 2007 and 2017. My office now estimates that we have as much as 17 million square feet of vacant retail. And that is a lot of restaurants that we have lost. Uh, in addition, one of the things that we have to do is figure out a real policy to reduce the fines and fees on restaurants. It's a good place to start. Uh, you know, the commercial rent tax, which does only apply in Manhattan under uh, South of 96th Street. I do think the industry there is in dire straits. We have to consider uh, a reduction in the CRT for restaurants, uh, certainly until outdoor dining is possible again. I know it costs money, but restaurants are in a uniquely tough position right now. And this would be a way to offer some targeted relief. I also think that we have to make sure that we are more proactive with our small businesses and city government, a lot of immigrant businesses are struggling. We need to help them develop uh, a tech platform. And that's another way that we could at least increase revenue until we start coming out of the pandemic. Thank you, Controller. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. So, Ms. Melba, you're not just born and buttered, you have buttered me. <laughs> and I, say go to Melba's during the pandemic. I did, and it was wonderful. Uh, and Jamal Bailey was mad at me for not bringing him a plate when he found out I had been needing at Melba. So, <laughs> but let me just say, you've raised a critically important issue. Uh, and I wanna start an the answer um, in part by saying one of the, when I was in city hall as the council to the mayor and I was responsible for women and minority owned business enterprises, right? But that was the direct contracting with city government. But one thing that was starting to become so clear was our small business services department, which did really some very important things for small businesses. But it was also siloed from some of the other things that we have to do, particularly now, not only now, but particularly now, given COVID, when we're looking at different sectors of small businesses. And when I was up at the Lip Bar in Mott Haven talking to Noel Santos, you know, one of the things she said to me 
um, that really struck me, and it's exactly what I hear you saying in a different way, is, you know, the problem is people in government who are trying to help us have never run a business. <laughs> and that part of what that means is that it becomes a one size fits all and it doesn't take into account what is different for different sectors of small business, right? And restaurants are their own type of small businesses with their own types of challenges. So number one, commercially affordable rent and having an affordable commercial rent program is something we don't have. And I will have an announcement, hopefully in the next few weeks on that. But the other thing we have to do is ensure that we have our, and, and not just silo different agencies of city government that restaurant owners or anyone has to go to to solve these problems. So we're gonna have a centralized way of coordinating so that it becomes a one-stop shop. But we do that in partnership, listening sector by sector, including restaurants, what solves the problems. Because if you don't come back, we don't come back. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Melba. I'm going to put you back to an attendee, and I'm sure I will talk to you very soon. All right. And Rob Bookman, you can unmute. Oh, San Andrew, don't lose Melba yet. Uh, let me answer that question. I think, oh, know, I'm sorry. Yeah. Whenever you're an A, you always get- I apologize. <laughs> I am so sorry. You go right. All good. All good. Uh, uh, Melba, thank you. Uh, all of us highlight how much we enjoy being at uh, your restaurant. Uh, not so much uh, that the food is great only, uh, but your energy. Uh, you're an amazing person and you, you the energy exudes uh, from that. Uh, let me say this. I call for, in my 100 Step Forward uh, document, uh, the same thing. Uh, that triple net uh, lease uh, that causes uh, the taxes to pass down uh, to the business owners, something we should look at. Uh, I believe uh, that we should uh, put a hold on it uh, for uh, two years at a minimum while we are going through uh, COVID-19 to get you back on your feet. But I also think uh, uh, Maya says something that is extremely significant because I hear that also. Too many people are making decisions about your business that never actually had to be part of a business. And government has no business being so entrenched in your business. We should be thinking about how do we promote and how do we lift business. And what I've learned from my days in the police department was that we have to have the whole team operating on the same mission. Mm -hmm. So when you go to the Department of Builders, they should not be looking how they could hold you up from getting that permit to uh, open your business. They should be judged by how many businesses they opened. Same with the Department of Consumer Affairs, same with uh, the fire department when you need a sprinkler system uh, inspected. We need to start having our entire city agency army to be focusing on how do we work and operate together on one mission and that is what we're missing in this city when we look at our businesses you think we too many people believe you are endless cash cow that whenever you want to raise uh, revenue you go to the small businesses to do so we have to stop thinking that way and that's what we're going to stop as the mayor thank you for president Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Wonderful. Well, Melba, we will certainly talk soon. Up next, we have the one and only Robert Bookman from the law firm Pusetsky and Bookman, founder, founding member of the New York City Hospitality Alliance, a dear friend of mine, mentor. I mean, he has been doing this and knows the ins and outs of this industry and the relationship with government uh, better, just as well as anyone else out there. So, um, with that, I want to give Rob Bookman the floor. This time the order will be Controller Stringer, Maya Wiley, Borough President Adams, Ray McGuire. Welcome, Rob. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew. It sounds like he's trying to promote me, get, get me out of the alliance and promote me to be deputy mayor or something. I don't know. Um, Eric, uh, Scott, good seeing you again. Uh, Maya and Ray, it's, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to uh, be speaking with you directly uh, after all these years. Um, and Maya, I hope your mother had a liquor license for when you were serving wines. Otherwise, uh, I don't think there's any statute of limitations there. Uh, well, it's closed, so we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, hey, look, as many of you know, I've been uh, an advocate for this hospitality industry, you know, for many decades, going back to multiple mayoral administrations. Um, and the restaurant bar and nightclub owners have always expressed significant frustration with the way city government regulates and inspects them. Uh, part of the problem about speaking, speaking to such intelligent people as yourselves is you've already anticipated my question, but we're going to ask it anyway, and so you maybe give a little more time on it. Um, for way too long, you know, government has treated us like an ATM. You know, for example, uh, under Mayor Bloomberg, fines from the health department went up from $12 million a year to $52 million a year. Same restaurant industry, same world-renowned restaurant industry. Um, the, the constant fines, the different inspectors giving them conflicting information, their permits and licenses getting stuck in red tape, they get inspections in the middle of their busy dinner service, interrupting operations. Uh, Eric, I know this is an issue you've worked on, the unfair multi-agency task forces that show up, and it seems that the only reason that they're showing up is to ruin your night, uh, doing inspections that could be done you know, during the day. Uh, so the question is, as mayor, specifically, how would you reshape and reform the city government's permitting, regulatory, and inspection process of our industry? And Control yeah. Springer, you are up first. Well, look, I've been uh, working on this issue with the Nightlife Association for a very long time. Step one, we have to reform the inspection process. Just look at the Department of Buildings. It's a walking conflict of interest. On the one hand, part of the Department of Buildings is to approve plans and get the bureaucracy moving. On the other hand, uh, the randomness of the inspection process actually has the opposite effect. I do believe we should split the Department of Buildings in half. I've been talking about this for a very long time. We need to professionalize an inspection process that speaks to consistency, so it should not matter which inspector or who goes out to inspect a restaurant. And we also have to make the industry and the inspection system user-friendly. How many times have we seen in bars and restaurants uh, at the height of the dinner hour or the late night hour when a bunch of inspectors come in, they go to the, up to the bar, they see a fruit fly in the liquor bottle, and the first thing they do is shut the restaurant down, shutting down businesses. And there's no question that part of inspection is just to get as much money into the general fund without regard to actually making sure the restaurant is safe, complying with the important food laws. And that has to be rethought and also stop the harassment because what happens is the politicians come in and look, I'm a former borough president. I did my share of restaurant openings. I had a big scissor. I met with the families. We cut ribbons to open up our small businesses and you know we celebrated and everyone wanted to make a speech and hug the family. But right after the politicians walked out of the restaurant, a whole new group of government people came right into that restaurant. Department of Consumer Affairs, DOB, all the agencies that want to find and fund businesses. I would create a whole new metrics for making sure we keep businesses safe and people who go to those businesses, but we cannot have this unruly mess that is wrecking the businesses of our city, the small businesses of our city. Thank you, uh, Maya Wiley. You know, there's a really important opportunity here to think differently about governance and to do it in a way that recognizes shared interests and how we bring folks to the table. So let me just say it this way. You know, I know and I know this is deeply important to everyone in the restaurant industry is public health and safety, because if we don't have public health and safety, people also don't want to go to restaurants. Right. So we're balancing constantly how we're communicating to the public that we're protect protecting that at the same time that we're protecting our businesses that are so important to making sure people have jobs, to making sure people can support the fam families, and also to attracting tourism and to making sure we have whole communities because it's also part of our community space. As I think Scott said earlier in terms of our open streets and how much that just saved us during COVID, I know it saved me to have our open streets corridors and be able to walk to my neighborhood restaurants and meet my neighbors and see folks. And so, so the way that we have to start doing that is by starting with an industry table that brings these issues to one place to figure out how we make sure 
We are both cutting the red tape and the regulatory problems that are not supposed to be undermining our restaurants. And I've heard it. I heard it from Carmine, who runs a Italian, wonderful Italian restaurant, you know, in St. Albans. And he, I walked in one day, and he's one of those restaurant owners who. You know, as soon as you walk up, his arms are up and out. And you're going to get a hug and he's going to pull up a chair. and He's going to sit down with you. And he was telling me about how they yeah. almost shut him down. And it, and it, and it is, was an important neighborhood institution and he was keeping people employed. So what was so clear about that was that the idea that the government hasn't sat down and worked through how to do, yeah, what part of what Scott is saying, right, is unify and create a more streamlined system, but also to make sure we're doing it in a way where we're very confidently and collectively communicating to the public that their health is being uh, uh, protected. Because one thing I will do as mayor is I'm going to be a cheerleader for the industry because it's also one of the things I love about New York City. Thank you. Borough President Eric Adams. You know, this is so important, uh, Rob, and uh, you, you, you're you going to hear me talk about this throughout the entire uh, campaign. Uh, just for going back, I always go back to my days of law enforcement. We used to have a gun that was used in a robbery, and a robbery unit would just focus on that arrest until we change our concept of what policing was about. We stated that you're no longer going to be lifted up by that just closing that one case. You must connect with the homicide unit to see if that gun was used. You must connect uh, with the uh, uh, units that's dealing with drugs to see if that gun was used. You were no longer being judged by what you did separately, but what you were doing as a team. That's the problem in our city. We exist in silos. We believe that what we are doing is the only mission and not the overall mission of the city. So that's why on 100 Steps Forward, I announced the idea of a My City card. That one card should have all the information that you need as a business person. It should allow you to file your paperwork. It should allow you to navigate the system. It should allow you to look at all of the issues that's dealing with your business as you expand, just as the citizens should have that. But also we should change our concept of fines and violation. I believe we need a a red, yellow, green system. Red being something that needs to be repaired right away, get uh, 24, 48 hours because it's life-threatening. Uh, yellow is something uh, that should be repaired because it's good for safety purpose. Give people seven days to two weeks to do it. And green is something that you can do in 30 days. Give the opportunity to fix the problem and not the opportunity to find a way the problem. Taxation through citation is not how you help businesses. And that's what I think is important. And we can do it by having our agencies operate together to build up our businesses and not destroy them. Thank you. Ray McGuire. Yeah, listen, um, what we've seen here in Melba, the great Melba was uh, in a restaurant that still had chairs there. So the restaurant had yet to open these delays can be crippling. So what I intend to do in specific is one, I want to create a shot clock for the small businesses permitting process. I want to require all the city agencies to complete the reviews and the inspections for most small businesses within 180 days. To alleviate the additional government costs, I will allow small restaurants and other businesses the opportunity. I want to be able to cure uh, more violations before having to pay fines. That's number two. Number three, I will either create metrics or I will create a red tape commission to identify ways to reduce what are wide ranging, unnecessary regulations, costs and delays. I was just recently with Yasmin Cruz who runs the Westchester uh, business, uh, the Westchester BID. And we sat outside or stood outside of a restaurant called Shanghai Red, which is one of the important convening places in the Bronx. We talked about the amount of permitting that was required same structure that was uh, there at uh, Westchester Square. Six or seven minutes away, there's another structure similar to that that had, a, had, that had been allowed to be open. So you get restaurants like this that get 45 fines from seven different agencies, simply cannot keep up. We need to cut the red tape. We need to put systems in place and metrics in place to make sure that everyone knows what's taking place. The restaurant owners, uh, the restaurant owners know what the metrics are that they need to uh, that they need to satisfy in order for them to uh, to remain open 
and for them to do business. Right now, it's crippling and it's not being applied uniformly. We need to make sure that we that we restructure the system to accommodate these restaurants because they're essential to what we do. That's my plan to make certain that we deal with the regulatory burden. All thoughtful answers. Thank you very much. I will see you in round two. Thank you. I am promoting our next, um, I see it says Rob Bookman, but it's actually <laughs> it's Massimo Felice. Are you there, Massimo? Massimo. Well, if he's not, um, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, there. Ah, oh, there you are. Where can we? Are you going to come on camera? Yes. I got. I got to read that question first. Though I read it, but I can't memorize it, my brother. Ah, all right. Well, listen. Well, let me introduce you. So, like I said, we're basically bringing restaurant tours from every district or every borough. Um, you know, different restaurant concepts. The next, I've known Massimo for a few years. He owns some incredible restaurants on Staten Island, the North Shore, uh, Venom, which is incredible, the Richmond. And if you get to go to Casa Belvedere, just the view is, is just incredible. And uh, he's always a straight shooter. He's an incredible chef and a good guy. So there he is. I'm sorry. I'm, no, I listened to the whole, I was here since the beginning, but they couldn't see me. And um... I've been driving. That's why. I'm sorry, man. We see you now. So uh, the order of questions. First up is going to be Maya Wiley, uh, followed by uh, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, Ray McGuire, and Controller Scott Stringer. Uh, Massimo, if you have the question, you're uh, ready to ask it. All right. I am ready. All right. And this is uh, Massimo, well, not, uh, Rob Bookman. <laughs> hello? Yep. You're on. Okay. Look, before the pandemic, before the virus hit us, um, there was well-intended yet controversial legislation introduced that would require small businesses to like restaurants like mine to uh, give their employees 100% employer-founded paid vacation. That's in addition to the paid sick leave they already have required by law. As a mayor, what would you be your position as such legislation? 100 small employer-funded mandates and what will be your general philosophy and guideline principles on proposed labor laws and small business owners express concern about this right now? Because one week paid vacation, one week sick leave and two week paid vacation, uh, definitely the wrong time to even think about something like that. Great. All right, you can bring yourself back on camera and Myla, you are up. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And, you know, look, I think it is critically important that we figure out exactly what supports our workers to be able to work with dignity and our small businesses to be able to survive. Those are two things that should not be pitted against each other. And let me just say one thing that, that is important to name here. So part of what we have to do as a city is also come together around how we're ensuring that we help our restaurant industry uh, survive. And that includes the Restaurants Act that's currently in Congress. And I have been talking to folks like Tom Colicchio and others who've been fighting for it. I'm a deep supporter of it because we also have to make sure you survive now so that we can work these other problems out over time. I do believe it is critically important because the restaurant sector has been such an important employer that we ensure that you be able to continue to be employers and we ensure that workers continue to be able to take care of themselves and their families. So I'm someone who's gonna hold both those things because I think we can walk and chew gum. I do think it calls us to the table. It means we have to come together and have real honest conversations about just how we do that. And that's the way I'm going to lead. I'm going to lead in partnership and I'm going to lead by calling us together. And I'm not going to shy away from hard conversations. They will always be principled. And I just told you what the principles are. There's got to be a both and because this is not a zero sum game. We will save our restaurant industry and we will do it in a way that enables people to support their families and we'll work it out. Thank you, Borough President Adams. And I've heard uh, restaurant owners, small business owners uh, talk about this over and over again, how the city and state uh, just really didn't engage in conversations on how to phase in uh, these important changes for workers. Uh, I am clear uh, that when we increase the minimum wage, when we do more for our workers, we improve our city. 
because if we pay our workers well, they can actually sit in those chairs and patronize our establishments. I think there's nothing worse uh, than a person that is operating or working inside a restaurant or facility and can't afford a meal in there. But with that said, government also has an obligation. If we're going to say that we want you to include a two weeks uh, vacation, government should play a, play a role also. Uh, we should find ways to alleviate your costs in a real way. Like an idea of what I uh, introduced in my 100 Step Forwards of using our Chamber of Commerce as back rooms uh, to do your administrative work, uh, to do your filing, your accounting, uh, to assist in all the documentation that you need to, uh, need to uh, produce and put in place. We need to find ways as we give you more obligations, we as government need to find ways of how do we bring down your course of doing business in the city to allow you to be productive, to just have and dictate to our small business owners as well as restaurants and not doing our share is the wrong thing to do. And we have done that too many times uh, in this city and in this state. And I believe thumbs up to uh, giving our employees the best that they can possibly have to be gainfully employed and have a quality, qualitative life. But at the same time, we must do our share to take down your course so you can be productive. Thank you. Uh, Ray McGuire. Massimo, listen, this is, this is an example of what's going to be necessary as I've identified uh, public-private partnerships. As you know, in my comeback plan, one of the things I've identified is to take 50,000 small businesses of which the restaurant business is gonna be an important part and to subsidize 50% of their wages for one year. We take care of 50% of their wages one for one year. In this conversation, while at the core of it is about business owners, it's also about the management and the staff, the performers, the suppliers, also are a large part of the population. 44% uh, of the population is Hispanic. 20 some odd percentage of the population is, is Asian. Many of these people uh, are, are not eligible for benefits. So we need to make certain that the burden on you all as owners is not so heavy that you can't do business. We also need to make certain that those people who are essential workers, the face-to-face the -face workers in the restaurants have some benefit. So we need to strike that balance. And that balance is gonna come from what is gonna be more needed in this comeback plan and that is a public-private partnership. So we have to be sensitive to both. It's a complicated issue and we need to come to the table to make sure that we negotiate so that you're not overly burdened, so that you can make a profit in what you're doing, so that you can contribute, continue to contribute to the overall economy and so that you can employ your employees and they can be employed with dignity in fairness and benefits. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Controller Stringer. I believe that the pandemic has exposed just how vulnerable our restaurant workers are. And I am a lifelong champion of workers' rights, and I'm committed to doing everything in my power to ensure workers are paid and treated fairly. Uh, I do think when we fight for our workers and we ask our restaurant industry to step up as you have, I also believe that we should give you the offset you need to help invest in your employees. And that is why we have to make sure that through a combination of tax credits and business incentives, we have to calculate the trade-offs so that we're able to empower workers. And when we treat workers fairly and justly, they stay with the business, we know that. Uh, but at the same time, we also have a role to play with our government. We need state tax, uh, I'm sorry, we need state relief for uh, the restaurant industry as well. We have talked a little bit about what I think the city should do, but at a minimum, we've got to expedite the issuance of the new liquor licenses. We got to ease restrictions on alcohol pickup delivery. Uh, we got to ease up on, as I mentioned, the, the enforcement protocols. But the state also has to join other states to make sure that people who uh, have uh, SNAP benefits also can purchase discounted restaurant meals. In other words, drive revenue to the small businesses, to the restaurants encourage the streetscapes, and then make sure that we're doing right by the workers. I do believe this is something uh, that we can accomplish by making sure we bring industry and employees together. 
Thank you, Massimo. Appreciate it. We are going to move you back to an attendee and bring up our next speaker. Thank you all for answering. And I think we got definitely a philosophy of, uh, you know, how you're looking at these issues. I'm not sure the direct answer to whether or not you would support the legislation, but we're definitely going to have more uh, forums and discussions. So uh, thank you. And obviously, Andrew. Yes. Well, they should do the city period. It's hard to you as a rep to explain to them how the restaurants really operate and what their profit margins really are, because I don't think many of them understand that. We will have that conversation. Thank you, Massimo. You got it, brother. And like we said, I think one of the most important things that's going to be not only now, but moving into the future is having people at the table that run the businesses. And I can tell you, particularly when it comes to these employment types of issues, uh, you know, we are a labor intensive business. We care about our people. And unfortunately, people in the industry, I hear often feel that it's set up like it's the employer against the employee. And it's not, it's really the employer against their financial statements and whether or not they are able to um, afford these types of benefits, even if they want to. So I do like to hear about the types of ways to offset. Uh, if you're going to add an additional cost, how do you offset it? If you are going to create more administrative burdens, how do you provide resources to these businesses to make it easier and also ensure that a minor violation, some technical violation, doesn't result in major liability as so many of these um, employment laws often do. Um, Andrew, we also ought to bring to the table the people who get capital to these restaurants, to these small businesses. They're going to be an important part of the conversation. Absolutely. Uh, well, next uh, is Alfredo Angira up here. You, I see your picture, you can let your video on, but uh, Alfredo is a, another just great restaurateur. Uh, sure, many of you may even know him, has three places in the Bronx, the Bronx Draft House, Bistro, and Bricks and Hops. And I just wanna say, particularly during the pandemic, he shows that when restaurants are in a crisis of their own, how they are stepping up and helping people in their community that are in their own crisis. Uh, so with that, Alfredo, the floor is going to be yours. Uh, the order this time is Borough President Adams, uh, Ray McGuire, Controller Stringer, and Maya Wiley. Alfredo, you can unmute yourself. Unmute. Okay, got it. First and foremost, I want to apologize. I had something come up, uh, so I had to jump into Uber. So I'm going to have my mask on. If you can't hear me, let me know, and I'll reiterate my question. It is uh, such as the life of a business owner. You know, sometimes you just have to, to get in the car and go. Um, secondly, I want to thank all of the potential mayoral candidates. Um, volunteering to serve this city is extremely admirable, especially considering the constraints that New York City is currently going to be under, uh, especially economically. Uh, you have a very large job ahead of you, and uh, I welcome working with any and all of you in achieving that goal for New York City. Um, I heard a lot of things mentioned in regards to the challenges that restaurants are going to be facing. That's both financial and that's regulatory. Um, we all know there are certain things regulatory that the city of New York really can't change. Uh, for example, a, a state liquor license. But there are things regulatory wise that New York City does have a hand in, namely the first step, uh, which is community boards. Uh, there have been a variety of nightclub owners, of restaurateurs, of bars who have expressed frustration with the entire community board process. Uh, namely, it's not representation, it's not an accurate representation at times of the community in which it serves. It's not, a, it's not a cross section of the fabric of that community. Oftentimes you have individuals who don't want to see change within that community for a variety of reasons, which is understandable at times, uh, but we are often faced with hurdles, whether that's getting a sidewalk cafe approved or whether that's getting uh, showing up for liquor license renewals. It often becomes a hurdle that hampers us. It, we, when I was opening up Bricks and Hops, for example, we couldn't even get a hold of our uh, community board chair so we can get the approval so we can get a letter so we can move forward. What, if anything, as a mayoral candidate, do you have that you're looking to streamline this process 
to make the community board element, that regulatory element for the city, easier for businesses like my own, so that this way we can move forward when COVID, God willing, is gone and we can hit the ground running. Thank you, Alfredo. Uh, Eric Adams, Borough President, you are up first. Uh, thank you, Alfredo, uh, for the question. And also thank you for what you did during COVID-19. I know how important it was to coordinate with our restaurants. I coordinated uh, to put a Brooklyn for Life initiative together that allows, uh, allowed us to help restaurants. We serve over 170,000 meals. Uh, 50 restaurants uh, participated, uh, generated about $1.5 million in Brooklyn's economy and raised over $400,000 through GoFundMe page by feeding our frontline workers. So this is a real plus. But I want to go, want to, go to the community board question that you, that you asked. Uh, Williamsburg Savings Bank, a young entrepreneur put all of his uh, sweat into establishing and opening the bank. It was a catering hall, beautiful reno renovation, millions of dollars. He needed his liquor license. He went to the community board. They denied it because they stated he'll make up too much noise. The bank is at the foot of the Williamsburg Bridge. You're not going to get any more noisier than that. I said unacceptable. I supported him to get his liquor license done. I also, as the bar president, had a combination of business leaders and uh, restaurant owners who sat on the communi community board that I appointed. We need a balanced voice and people should not shop in government to hold to the necks of legitimate businesses. We've, we have witnessed that too many times that people utilize the community board process to prevent the opening of legitimate establishment that employ low skill, low education, low educated individuals. That's not acceptable. Now, as the mayor, we no longer would do the appointments for the community board. So it's important to have a real partnership with our city council members and the borough presidents. And that's what I am attended to do. Thank you. Ray McGuire, you're up. Yeah, you know, uh, I was just, as I said, recently in the Bronx. And one of the things that is so important and it happens around each of the boroughs is to focus on not only the community boards but also the bids in these in these uh in these neighborhoods who can be very important interveners who can bridge between the community and the businesses and i saw that in action we need to make certain that these that these bids the business the business districts that are local are funded so they can uh, they can apply the support that they can supply to the business, so that any differences between their views and the community board views get worked out there. So there are very specific ways that we can go about doing this. Uh, we have empowered community boards, but we also need to empower the BIDs. And I saw that at work, and that's something I would go and be supportive of, which is one of the ways we're going to break through what will be impasses naturally between those people who are uh, have a certain agenda and those who have an another agenda. And the BIDs can be very helpful. Thank you. Next up, we have Controller Stringer. Well, I have to admit, uh, you know, I was appointed as one of two teenagers to a community board uh, when I was 16 years old. So I don't think anybody on this Zoom or any other Zoom has been to more community board meetings than I have. And I do believe in community boards because I believe in community based planning. And I believe that borough presidents in particular, but not limited to them, need to partner with the different stakeholders on community boards to find common ground. It's why I initiated a historic community board reform merit-based selection process of our community boards, not only getting more uh, people of color in different parts of Manhattan on community boards, but also different stakeholders to make sure that we had labor leaders on community boards, to make sure that we had business leaders on community boards. Uh, I did, uh, as controller, uh, do a, uh, a red tape commission where I held hearings in every borough, came up with 60 ideas to make it easier for small businesses to survive. And part of that plan is also about making sure that we bring community and business together. This is gonna be crucial as we start to come back from COVID. Again, we've lost 2,800 businesses that employ 50 people or less, and we have these vacant corridors. They're not just an eyesore, they're also an opportunity. And this is why we need to bring communities together 
to start to plan the kind of businesses that we want to root for in neighborhoods and also how we can bring back our special and wonderful restaurant and bars. Lastly, I just want to remind many of you who I worked with, when I became borough president back in the day, and there was a lot of pushback to the bars and restaurants and the clubs, you know, I worked with the industry to, to do a report that showed that the restaurant businesses account for over a billion dollars to the city's economy every year. And that started to get everyone's attention saying, hey, wait a minute, this is bigger than my street. This is bigger than my community. This is a legitimate industry. And now that we've lost 62 million tourists, I believe that we can build consensus to bring back our nightlife industry. Because when the nightlife industry comes back, you all know what's gonna happen. The tourists are gonna come. Thank you. Maya Wiley, you're up. So first of all, I wanna say I've eaten at only two of your three establishments, though, but I'm looking forward to coming to the third. But I also know how important you have been, not just as a business owner, but as a community leader. And I know from Noel how much all of you as businesses in, in that block have held each other down and how important that has been for the community and for the neighborhood. And I myself have enjoyed it, so thank you. Uh, this is one of the things that we fundamentally have to do differently is how we do planning. Because a big part of what I hear and what you say is the fact that people just get pitted against each other in terms of what's happening immediately rather than coming up with what makes our communities whole? What do we need to have in all our communities? Because we need jobs. We need places for us to gather. We do love and want nightlife. Uh, and then there's always the balance between how we do that in a way that also holds on to the character of our communities. And one of the things that has not happened sufficiently in city government, that it has absolutely every power to do, is that kind of planning. But it has to be active, it has to be engaged, it has to be a partner. And as the, I think the only candidate in this race who has actually sat in the hot kitchen that is called City Hall, I'll tell you some of the mechanisms that haven't been utilized. So communities, the Community Affairs Unit, which is a critically important opportunity for City Hall to actually do that on the daily, right? Because those are the staff that are actually embedded in interacting with community. But it's usually used only as a, as a one-way conversation where it's like, we're gonna roll something out, we want you to support it. Rather than being engaged in what's going on, what's coming up, how can we help, and where and how do we help organize and mobilize the planning for the community so that it isn't just waiting for a problem, but it is also forward-looking into the planning. And I'll tell you, I, am, I have New Deal New York, which is a $10 billion capital construction plan, but that plan has in it that communities like Mont Haven hit hardest by COVID and that need to not just recover, but get investments that reimagine them mean partnerships with communities on just what that money should do. So we would also actively be partnering with you and others in the community about just how it grows and develops in a way that is solving community problems. That can create a very different planning and community dynamic and that's proactive, not reactive. And that's how I will do. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Alfredo. Always one good to one see thing you. before oh, I, I before I, before I go back to a participant, um, if I may share one thought with with all of you, and that okay. that goes to Ray, that goes to Maya, that goes to Scott, um, all, all of the all of the potential candidates. Which, in one way or another, I, I've met you at some point. Uh, is you know, there's been a lot of talk about doing the outdoors cafes permanently. And if that is the case, you're gonna have a lot of issues again with parking and things of that nature. I am for it uh, because it expands our footprint, but I think New York City at least should give us some guidance. There are a million and one different outdoor types of cafes. We spent $8,000 on ours before, you know, we got some assistance. Uh, what I would suggest to all of the candidates is, you know, for this new administration that's coming in, is to at least have four or five different cafe designs that are stamped with an approval that we don't have to have an inspector come by every two hours to tell us that we're wrong and we owe them a fine. Uh, and we can pick for one of those four. Very smart. Very smart. Righty. Thanks, Alfredo. Yeah. All right. And Andrew, I apologize. I have to hop off, but I want to do one more round. I'm pushing my staff a little bit, but I had uh, another we'll engagement. Get you, right, yep. We'll get you yep. to go next. So we'll put you uh, right after the first speaker. Uh, 
Anya Sebastianikova from House of Yes in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Uh, when you talk about you know venues, well, first I should say Anya is the co-founder and creative director of House of Yes, which is a uh, performance-fueled nightclub and create a uh, creative collective in Brooklyn. Um, I mean, when you talk about how you define New York City's nightlife these days uh, and our culture, House of Yes and what she and her team have done over there is really uh, incredible. And I mean, while we've been shut down, they had this holiday market. I was over there with my daughter and she got like a crystal and it just shows the creativity um, of this industry um, and also what it means to people. You know, it's more of than a place we just go out to, to hang out. It's really a place where we find ourselves, we express ourselves. And I think that is said and done uh, really no place better than uh, House of Yes. So with that, I wanna give the floor to Anya. I wanna go to Ray, we'll go to Maya, uh, and then we'll uh, continue with uh, the um, uh, controller and the borough president. Anya, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. And it's uh, very exciting to see uh, and refreshing to see candidates that take our industry seriously. Um, my question for you is, uh, candidates running for elected office always have a long list of policy promises, but there's a big difference between campaign promises and enacting policy if elected. How will your administration's policies differ from the previous ones in regarding to hospitality and nightlife legislation? And what makes you uniquely qualified when working with the state governor and legislature to accomplish these goals? So uh, what is different here, Anya, is that I've never given a campaign promise since I've never uh, run for office. So uh, what, I, what I can tell you and what I can commit to is that in my almost four decades in business, I've never gone with a promise unfulfilled and I would expect to continue that track record, which is a trusted and verifiable track record. Uh, with respect to uh, the difference between me and potentially others, one, uh, the investment, the involvement that I've had in arts and culture, in arts education uh, since my time in New York, where I have been a significant a participant and contributor and been involved uh, in leading many of the arts and cultural institutions in this city. And one of the things that I have committed to is uh, with respect to the arts in June of 2022 to make sure that I, that I sponsor part of my comeback plan. Anya is to sponsor uh, the largest arts festival that this city has ever known in June of 2022 to make certain that we include all the artists, the performing artists, the visual artists. I also wanna make certain that I give a stipend to, to a thousand artists throughout the city so that we can celebrate the arts uh, beginning in June of 2022, so that I launched that festival so that all New Yorkers in every borough get to participate. With respect to the administration, there's so many, the list of, the list of things that have not gotten accomplished between the administration and business is a pretty long list. The way I would do this is I would make certain, as I've identified in my comeback plan, to get jobs, to give subsidies to small businesses, especially, especially the businesses, the, the hospitality industry. The other thing that I would do is to make sure that I would have a small business administration that would be empowered. I'd have a deputy mayor who would be empowered so that businesses become clients of the city, that they wouldn't be alienated and the arts wouldn't be alienated, but it would be part of, and I would focus specifically on the arts and culture and hospitality, because that's the lifeblood of this city. And it's something I've been involved with in almost, as I said, almost four decades in this city where you can go check the record. So the promises have been fulfilled and I never make a promise that I can't fulfill. And the thing that I, that I can tell you is I don't have to remember tomorrow what I told you today because the truth doesn't change. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Maya, we'll let you jump in. Yeah, thank you, Anya, for that really important and honest question. I am the person in this race who has been a change maker my whole adult, adult career. I am a civil rights lawyer and a racial justice advocate that spent 30 years on coalition building and policy design around policy change to serve to create more equity 
for communities and always doing that in partnership because that's the only way you make policies that work and policies that have a way to change. No one who ever looked like me or thinks like me or has the background I have has ever been the mayor of this city. I come from a community, not from a political machine. And I say that because primarily what you're pointing to is something we've already done in this campaign, which is we don't just create policy lists. What we have done is pull together people, including in people's assemblies, where we invite New Yorkers from all over the city. And by the way, no one has to, and we are very explicit about that, support me as a candidate to participate because we have been sourcing the ideas uh, and the challenges and the opportunities and the priorities directly from people who are impacted. On the business side, that includes small businesses. Um, and so what we do is we actually develop our policies that way. And I put my staff, <laughs> and they'll joke and tease you about it if, they, if you give them half a chance, that I stress test it. And we have put out policy proposals based primarily on what I can do is mayor, including without permission from Albany or the federal government. And that is not because I won't work with them because I absolutely will partner. And I've done it outside of city government and inside of city government when I sat in city hall. But here's the thing, here's the thing. In a crisis like this, part of where the way we're making promises is by looking at what our power is and the power to get it done. And that's why our New Deal New York policy is one I can do as mayor without permission from Albany and without any additional dollars from the federal government. And so that's how we're rolling and that's how we're gonna roll out our next set of policies, which is gonna be our next set uh, that will have included engagement with small businesses. Thank you, Maya. I know you're gonna to have to jump, but real quickly, one quick last rapid uh, round. You named a couple of your favorite restaurants. Just give us a couple of your favorite restaurants, bars, nightclubs in the city, and then you're free to... Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I have such a long list, it wouldn't be rapid, but I will say uh, Il Posto Acanto on the Lower East Side, I just ate, it was the last one I ate at just uh, less than two weeks ago, had a family dinner there. Uh, Beatrice and Julio are amazing, uh, one of our favorite places to go, and I won't go through my whole list because then you'll shout at me for not being fast. <laughs> that, that's a good, I was there recently as well, so, and then they both amazing. are wonderful people. They Great. are. Thanks for uh, joining us and we'll talk to you soon. And next up is Controller Stringer. Thank you. Look, the this is not gonna be an easy comeback for nightlife and for our communities. And it's gonna take real government experience. And that's what I bring to this campaign. 30 years as an assemblyman working on real legislation in Albany and at the same time being a blazing reformer. As a borough president, who funded not just Museum Mile, but funded arts and culture throughout the borough, the small groups, the big groups. I didn't fund the fancy lavish parties. What I funded was the back office, the wiring, the telephones, all the things that you think about when you're in government. And a lot of proposals don't work because you just don't throw money at things in government. You actually have to have an understanding of the capital budget and the operating budget and how you transform agencies like the Department of Cultural Affairs, which does need to change post pandemic. And also you gotta think about arts and culture and children and what government can do. And that's why when I became controller, I did the analysis that showed that we did not have uh, certified arts teachers in so many of our public schools, 400 of them. And you know where they were? Mostly in Brooklyn, in central Brooklyn. Uh, mostly in, in the South Bronx and the parts of the Bronx that didn't have certified arts teachers. In fact, Mayor de Blasio called me up and said during the first year in office and said, is this true? Can you prove this? I went to see him and we funded private public partnership to get those certified arts teachers together. And that is what the next mayor is gonna have to do, govern, no training wheels, no, uh, no learning on the job because we're in a unique situation. So I know the budget. I know land use and zoning. I know how to fund arts and culture because I did it for eight years. And I know how we reset Albany. And if I can do this work as mayor the same way I did it as a upstanding elected official that got real results, then I think I could lead us out of this pandemic. Thank you, controller.
Borough President Adams, you're up. Thank you so much. And I, I love a House of Yes. As, you know, if, you, if anyone has not visited the location, I really encourage you to do so. And you're right, and your question is a valid one. And I believe there are two lists that you do accumulate uh, when you are running for office. Uh, one, you should look at the things that are within your span of control and that they are doable. Uh, the second is are the, are the things that you must do on the federal level and on the state level. And it's the combination of all of those things. And when you do an analysis of day one in Borough Hall, I laid out what I wanted to accomplish. I laid down how I wanted to put resources in our schools. And I did $165 million in the Department of Education. I laid out how I wanted to bring our communities together and I had programs such as Breaking Bread, Building Bonds to celebrate the diversity of the borough of Brooklyn. I laid, a, laid out job growth. Uh, Brooklyn has had the largest growth in tech startups out of all of the other boroughs. And I also wanted to use the office of Borough Hall as a way that people can navigate the complexities of government. Uh, the thousands of calls we received through my constituents assistance unit showed how we have engaged with New Yorkers and Brooklynites on the ground and understood the problems that were facing them, but also to think differently how government is supposed to, supposed to operate to bring public safety to our borough. We had an unprecedented decrease in crime as we partnered with the various groups and organizations. I say that to say the plans I lay out in my 100 step forward document shows you the things within the span of control as the mayor of the city that are doable. Our city is dysfunctional and I'm going to show you how we realign our agencies to become a functional city that can be ready for the deep to go deep into the 21st century. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Anya, again. You know, this is what it's all about. It's about bringing people who are in there day to day, running these businesses, creating these experiences. And Anya and her team have been incredible. Uh, we have a partnership with the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault, and we've worked on issues related to consent and violence within nightlife. And really, not only running a business for the sake of running a business, but running a business in a way to actually better society and create environments where people are welcome and can express themselves. And like I said before, House of Yes uh, really is one of those venues. So I want to thank you for uh, joining thank us you tonight. So much. I'm going to pass you back to a um, attendee, and then I am going to bring our final question before our lightning round. I am promoting our friend, Lois and Gordon from Nears Tavern in Queens. Hey, Lois and so. I mean, if you haven't heard, there is a iconic historic uh, place called Nears Tavern that's 191 years old in Woodhaven. Um, you know, I, I, you may have read that it almost closed last year uh, or maybe it was the year before, uh, but just the tenacity and uh, this man right here rallying the community to save these historic eating and drinking places is just phenomenal. And not only does it have the claim of maybe being one of the oldest taverns uh, and being saved, but uh, if I recall, there was also a scene from Goodfellas that was filmed there. So, I mean, you can't get uh, more horse historic from that. So the order of questions here, Ray McGuire, Comptroller Stringer, and then Borough President uh, Adams. Loisant, you can unmute yourself and uh, the digital or virtual floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I apologize. I, I, there's a documentary uh, that's following me, so the light is like totally bright, and they're trying to film. So it's nice. <laughs> like, very, very. Like, eh, turn it down. It's too bright. <laughs> so they're documenting um, so much that's happened to our restaurant industry uh, over the past 12 months, um, and so it's important. So I decided to participate. So they're following me and things like that, and. So I apologize for the bright, bright lights. It's killing me too, but it's fulfilled. Either way, um, I just want to get to real quick. I know you guys are taking some time to really hear from the restaurant industry, and I commend you for that. That is very admirable. I also want to say, um, uh, you know, as this rhetoric about uh, out of boroughs, um, uh, it just creates a sense of a disconnection, a division. And I really uh, think I've been a community advocate. I'm a community builder. I've always been that. 
And when I decided to take over Historic Nearest Tavern in 2009, uh, when it's three days from closing, it wasn't because I was a restaurateur because I had no experience. It was because the community came together and said, this is important to me. This is something that's important. When everybody forgot about this place in this small little community called Woodhaven, which I want to thank Scott Stringer for actually coming to Woodhaven Bid and talking with Raquel. And I've seen you there and you just right into the, the nitty gritty of what's going on in the community. So I just want to take that minute. I don't know Ray. I don't know Eric so much, you know, um, but as a black man, I really think it's important for us to create the sense of connection that we're all one. That is New York. New York is a melting pot and New York is going to come back that way. I don't think we're going to save New York from, by policymaking. I think it's creating a sense of community. And so what I want to talk about is that besides policymaking, all of these policymakings that inevitably is skewed one side or another. You saw that with PPP, when all the money was gone and within those two weeks of trying to get money, a lot of other business was, was, was closed because they couldn't save themselves because of delay. So I think besides policymaking, I think mayors has, uh, can host events and initiative to help promote the city's, uh, you know, the, the city's restaurant nightlife industry, um, which I think is very important, will be very important to the, to, to the city as we recover from COVID-19. That is gonna be very important. Um, I, I, I kind of wanna say the great example of that is the late Mayor Dinkins, who actually created Restaurant Week back in 1992, and it's still going strong today under, they even pivoted into Restaurant Week to go, which I'm also a part of, right? So it's not so much uh, policy making. And so with that, the question I have for you uh, is that, you know, what kind of events or initiative that will promote that sense of community, not just policy making, right? Sometimes you try to make this, this thing to, ch to change something, you know, you, you could create a 5,000 page book law on how to cross the street. But if you empower people to create a sense of community to care for each other, you know, I think we have a better chance. So what kind of events or initiative would you undertake as the mayor uh, post COVID to help restore New York City as the culinary capital of the world and the city, the vibrant city that never sleeps again. Thank you. First up, we have Ray McGuire. Thank you for the question and a lot of respect for all that you have endured and for your leadership and for your reference to uh, David Dinkins. I would also reference you to the great Maynard Jackson who did bring his city together. And the reason I reference that is because he made certain that black and brown businesses were included in his comeback. So what I've identified in specific and what I've talked about here is my years long, decades long investment in making certain that I build coalitions and bring the city together in arts and in culture. And if you look across arts and culture, you look across the economy, you look across education, you look across what's taking place in the criminal justice system and in the healthcare system, I have a, I have a lifelong commitment to bringing, uh, bringing different people together. And to your point, we're going to, have to bring this entire city together. It is today broke, it's broken and divided. And we need a leader who's got the relationship to bring the city together. In specific, what I've identified in my comeback plan is a comeback festival. And that comeback festival is one where I intend to launch it in the spring of 22. It's going to include venues and galleries and performance stages. Bars and restaurants are going to be included. Parks in every neighborhood. We're going to make the city the top destination for travelers from around the world. I'm going to make certain the boroughs are directly involved in this. I want to create competitions in each of the boroughs that have to do with uh, commissioning artists in each of the boroughs in outdoor spaces to create art. So that takes us outside and allows us to enjoy each other. Remember when we wrapped uh, Central Park with Crystal and what a convenient event that was. And we need to do that in each of the boroughs. And we need to make certain that like restaurant week, when I have my comeback festival, the restaurants are going to be part of this. Nightlife is going to be an active part of this. So as a matter of policy that is designed into the policy, as a matter of practice, I've always fulfilled my commitment. So what I'm committing to you today is you being at the table with me as I design and execute on this comeback festival for spring of 2022. Thank you. Controller Stringer, you're up. Well, it's very good to see you. And uh, one of the great opportunities I've had as a lifelong New Yorker and having now served the city as controller is visiting almost every amazing 
place and community in the city. It has informed my thinking and my judgment in the city to go to all the different restaurants and cultural activities. It's clear to me that we do need at this moment wholesale fundamental change the way we are going to bring this pandemic back. And I just want to say that I agree with Ray, and, and that's a great idea to have a festival after 9-11, by the way. Uh, the leadership at that time was hell-bent on making sure Broadway opened immediately. And these are important initiatives to think about. But I just want us to think how we can reimagine our streetscape in ways that can improve the neighborhoods and create vibrant local economies. How we create wealth in all of our communities, especially in communities uh, that have struggled economically, communities of color. That's how we're gonna attract people to New York City worldwide. That's how we're gonna become the culinary capital because people are gonna come from all over the world to see how we did it, how we brought back our streets. And today I put forth the largest transportation plan the city has ever seen. It's about opening up streets for local businesses, restaurants and retailers, but let's widen sidewalks. Let's create space for more seating. How about bus shelters and bike parking, public restrooms, keep the streets clean and open and plan streets that encourage people to eat, to shop, to walk local. That could be a festival 365 days a week because people want to see how we're going to do this. And finally, the bottom line here, and this is what I've learned uh, representing the city, the only candidate to get elected citywide, uh, not once but twice. Uh, I can tell you right now, we've got to bring all, everybody to the table in a real way. Community boards, local restaurant owners who end up like yourself becoming pillars of the community. And that's the way we're going to get through this. But we also have to reform and reimagine our city agency, whether it's Department of Cultural Affairs or Consumer Affairs. There's so much bureaucratic weight that has failed to create the moment for creativity, the moment to reimagine this economy. I don't like to shout out any other place but New York City, but we could peek at what Paris is doing in Copenhagen and Barcelona. There, there are places that we could look for as to how we can reimagine our streets, our transportation network and our businesses. We'll do it better than them, we always do. Uh, but we should probably do a little bit more thinking and planning. And that's what I'm going to try to do as mayor. By the way, I have to go team. Uh, so I just want to say goodbye to all of you. It's been great. I look forward to seeing you when the comeback begins and we're all together in person. So thank you very much. Thank you, controller. Thank you. President Adams. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, thanks for your question. Uh, I would say this, that the people of the city, uh, they do not look at other boroughs as out of boroughs, but our governmental agencies have treated the other four boroughs as the out of boroughs. And we need to acknowledge that. And nothing personifies that more uh, than how we treat things like festi festivals, open streets, uh, biking, all of those things. We isolate it to gentrify communities. We don't go into the Brownsvilles of our city, the South Jamaica, Queens, the South Bronx. We have had two level of policies where we invite uh, the open streets, we invite uh, the activity, but in those areas where they're dealing with real internal issues, we, we ignore them, not while I'm mayor. I believe that just as we have a museum mile or a highliner in Manhattan, uh, we can transform closed railroad tracks right in Brooklyn as well. We can do a better job in how we treat the entire city as one. And that's crucial to look at. But I also believe that the Department of Cultural Affairs must think differently. We, wish we should green light more open spaces to be utilized as stages and for uh, art installations. And I think the Parks Department should approve and expedite more permits for performances. Government gets in the way of allowing this live activity that encourages people to leave uh, their comfort zone and enjoy the beauty of discomfort of new, meeting someone new and understanding and appreciating new cultures. Uh, that's what we did when we had to dine in Brooklyn program and restaurant weeks uh, to expand and promote uh, restaurants in the borough of Brooklyn. But there's an opportunity here also to build out a real culinary 
program in our schools, similar to the one that's at New York City uh, College of Technology. Uh, Councilman Traeger and I have communicated often about really showing our young people the wonderful world of preparing food and creating food and doing things in a real way. So there are great opportunities here, but not part of the city should benefit from it. All of the city should benefit from it. And historically, we have not done that. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Good seeing you. Look, I can't wait to see this documentary. We'll talk soon. I'm going to promote you back to a attendee. All right. Well, with that, we have concluded the uh, question segment. Uh, we are going to go into the lightning round, but we actually, you've all addressed some of the lightning round uh, questions. Um, so I guess just two quick things as I bring my colleague uh, Rob Bookman back to say a few words. Um, one, and I guess we'll start with uh, Ray and then we'll go to um, Eric. Um, do you support uh, permanently capping third party delivery fees by companies like uh, Grubhub and Seamless that were charging you know, 30 percent uh, fee per each transaction? There's currently a temporary COVID cap. Would you support uh, Ray making that cap permanent? You know, I, I want to take a look at it, Andrew. I think in a time of COVID, we're in extreme uh, circumstances. So I would want to look at when we are kind of through COVID and take a review of that to see the implications it has on those people, especially those people who can't uh, access groceries, who can't get to uh, get kid to the food restaurant, especially the seniors and those who are disabled. So I want to take a careful look at that to see that whatever fees are being charged are fees that they can afford. Excellent. And yourself, borough president? Uh, uh, heck yes. Uh, right. know, these guys uh, were really uh, overusing and exploiting uh, the moment. Not everyone lost money during COVID-19. And I believe not only should we cap them, we should demand that what they're doing to delivery workers, uh, not allowing them to have a place to use a restroom, not paying them the right salaries, not ensuring that they have insurance. We need to really look at these, this new industry and adjust it to make sure that it's fair and equitable. I say, heck yes, cap it. Great, and before we get to some closing comments and remarks, I'll start with you, uh, Borough President, because we're there. Name some of your favorite uh, restaurants, bars, and nightclubs. I know you have a lot of them, but uh, <laughs> some go-to spots for you. You know, I got a couple of places. Uh, Imani in Brooklyn is one of my favorite places. Uh, Unde Toi, they just closed, unfortunately, to the conditions we're in. I enjoy, but you know I'm a vegan, so a seasoned vegan. Uh, vegan soul food in Harlem is one of my favorites. And I like having a small location that people sometimes overlook. Uh, Uptown Veg in Harlem, I stop by there all the time if I'm in Harlem. Great. And yourself, Ray? I got a few of them. So I got, you know, Peaches in Bed Stuy. I like the Lamb's Club by uh, David Rabin. I like Friction Hops, uh, Willie Colon. I like Melba's, of course, with Melba. I like Red Rooster with Marcus. I like San Pietro's with uh, uh, with uh, Gerardo. I like Sangria's. So, you know, the list is long and uh, I like them all. Well, listen, I think the deal is when this is all over and everyone can just get together, there's going to have to be some big celebrations. And, uh, you know, however this race ends up, hopefully be there. Before we uh, cut it out, I just want to... Uh, turn the floor over to my colleague, Rob Bookman, to say a few comments, and then I'll make a few closing comments. You're both welcome to please uh, stay on here for another moment or two. Rob? Uh, Ray, Ray, you were trying to get, you're trying to soften, soften me up by uh, mentioning David Raven, man. Uh, <laughs> we were the original Batman and Robin. When we, when <laughs> I, I, you know, it, it's, it's almost three decades, and he has been a longstanding exemplary leader in your industry. So a lot of shout out to David, wherever he is. And yes, he has. Uh, he, he is on our he is on our executive board, and he is uh, one of the leaders in this industry. He's been in this battle for a long, long, long time. Looks at like texting me questions the whole time. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> right. I want to uh, thank the both of you for being here. I'm sure the staff of uh, Scott and Maya are still you know you know listening in at the end. Um, I know you guys are doing a lot of these, and so you might take it for granted, uh, but. 
for the hundreds, and we literally had hundreds of restaurant and nightclub and bar owners you know, listening into this. We don't take it for granted. It's very significant to us that we have mayoral candidates that care enough to come, spend an hour and a half, answer our questions, and care what we have to say. Uh, when David and I formed uh, the Nightlife Association too many years ago, and I remember we, in our first meeting that we tried to get with the Giuliani administration, they refused to meet with us unless we gave them the social security numbers of all the executive board. And when we asked why, they said we wanted to make sure, we want to do a background check to make sure we're not meeting with criminals. Uh, we, ob we obviously politely or in my, not so politely declined that meeting. Um, but we've come from there to here. And for us as an industry, that's not nothing. Uh, and so we want to thank you very much uh, for caring about us. Every one of you had at least one or two great ideas that I wrote down that we will definitely steal if you're not elected. Um, and uh, we hope to continue this conversation you know, with you, you know, in the months to come. Please uh, rely on Andrew and myself as a resource when you have questions about our industry or small businesses. Um, you know, we'll be happy to uh, work with your staff. And again, thank you. Thank you very much for, for joining us tonight. So just you just have to tell us that in the height of the, the uh, comeback festival that we can get reservations. Absolutely. I just Rick is very good with that. He spends half his time giving getting people reservations. <laughs> we'll pay full freight. We just want to make sure we can get oh, it. That, that goes without saying. <laughs> I want to uh, echo Rob's comments. Uh, we are just incredibly, you know, grateful that the people who are going to be in these positions of power are looking at our industry for the powerful economic and social force we are. I've always said about the industry, if we can harness our vitality, there's nothing that we cannot do. And to do something, we can't just talk about it, we need to be about it. So we appreciate you all answering our questions. We know we'll continue to have these conversations. We urge you to continue to advocate for the industry. As you heard from our speakers, just the diversity and what we bring to our city is incredible and it makes it what New York is. I mean, going back to my great grandparents, we had bakeries and cafes in Brooklyn and Queens. I grew up working there. So many other people, this is not just a job, this is their life, it's who they are and it is why they are where they are. So I wanna again, thank, uh, Borough President Adams, Ray McGuire, Controller Stringer, Maya Wiley, uh, KI Legal, all of our members and supporters, the press who joined us today. We grateful for how you follow and report on our industry. Um, we just, you know, like I said, this stuff is our life to us. And we are going to keep fighting through the Hospitality Alliance to bring back our industry so we can bring our city back. And there is no doubt whoever is the next mayor of New York City is going to play an enormous, extraordinary role in supporting and enacting policies to help us come back. So with that, I want to thank you all for joining our first NYC Mayoral Candidate Forum, the Restaurant and Nightlife Edition. I don't know if they still say rock the vote anymore, but remember June 22nd is the primary. May, I'm sorry, March 3rd is going to be our next forum. You're gonna hear some, some additional great candidates. We thank you all. Have a great night. I know everyone has places to go. Peace. <laughs>